Help me understand when you, how you got from the Midwest working on your dad's car and all that to NASCAR. Yeah, so we we were racing up there quite a lot, and um, up where up in Illinois, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Ohio, all those places up there, right? And man, a lot of great racers, man. I've just uh, the names just you know are just phenomenal. The folks we used to race against back then, and and I can remember watching on TV, and I was actually at my buddy's house, and we were racing at uh, the Short Track Championships at Rockford Speedway, and I was staying at his house, and um, we were watching an old race, and it was actually, we were talking about your dad and uh, Kirk Shelmerdine and those guys, and I was like, man, I, I cannot wait to get the opportunity to be crew chief on a cup car. And he's like, what? I'm like, man, I'm telling you, I'm doing it. And he's like, no way, really? And I said, yeah. And he's like, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And his name was Jimmy Lauder, and he actually loaned me $1,000 to try to get me, get, get me stable so I could get down here. And my aunt and uncle lived in... Uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, mm. which is just not too far away from about an hour and a half east. And uh, I called him up and I said, hey, I want to get down to North Carolina to go racing. Um, you know, can I come down and stay with you guys? And they said, yeah. So they came up um, shortly after I graduated high school, only a few days. And uh, I packed up everything I had in a, a little U-Haul trailer. And we put it behind their Ford Taurus wagon and drove it down. It was a motorcycle. Um, of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> a black and white TV. And a basket of clothing. That's really all I had. And a little small U-Haul. Like that eight-foot-long U-Haul. Like everything I owned was in that. I lived with them, and I tried to get on uh, with a cup team. And uh, and how did you go about doing that? Well, so like I had mentioned, we raced with a lot of cool folks. Um, Alan Quickie, Mark Martin, um, Rusty Wallace, a lot of those guys. And Mark was fantastic through this period of my life because I was doing I, – I just needed people. Like I didn't know who to talk to. Um, I knew some guys that worked at – owned a, uh, a, a trucking company. I, I can't remember Barrett's or Barnett's or somebody like that at that point. I knew that guy. So I was trying to use him to get some influence on a race team, but I would call Mark weekly after on a Monday and be like, Hey, you know, anything open over there yet? You know, you got any opportunities? Um, so we were chatting and he was passing me along to different folks. Um, Alan Kawicki at that point, I actually, um, had an opportunity to go to work with him and, uh, it was great. It was going awesome. I was like, man, this is a shot with Alan. But what happened was he lost Xerox that same year. And so when you uh, – wait, wait, wait. So when you go over to work at, um, at Allen's – Well, but I didn't. You said you, you never made it. To. Never made it. He lost a sponsor, and he called me up. He was like, look, I don't know if I'm going to have a deal next year, so I, got, I don't have anything for you. So, so that was pretty painful. So I lost that shot and uh, went on and on and on, and I kept on sending <laughs> – this one's funny. So Larry was at King Racing – uh, Larry McReynolds, um, I had sent him a letter and a resume and all that, uh, wrote me back, which I still have the letter said, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry, young man, you don't, you're not qualified to come to work for us. Did the same thing with Hammond when he was at Sabco and he said, no, nope, no, nope, we don't need you. You're not, not qualified enough. And I got both those letters still. But at least they replied. They did. They were the only two that really replied. What yeah. were you wanting to do? Man, Any, I, just, I mean, probably anything, anything but anything. like you had to have like a expertise. You had to have like, this is where I love to get. I'd love to work on this piece, this no, part. No, Nothing. not back then, man. Back then, it was that you did it all, right? You did it all. You did everything. You 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 did body work. You painted. You mechanic. You changed tires. You you welded. You drove drove the transporter to and from. You know, you did it all. And, that's true. And that's that's what I did, and that's how I learned with my dad and my father and I. We were very fortunate. We won a bunch of championships up north and a bunch of races. And he taught me the. Um, regimency you needed to to run in a weekly series and be competitive year in and year out and and so i did a lot of stuff um but ultimately what ended up happening dale is uh, uh the company i was working for in in lumberton they they gave me a choice they said look um where you're at right now and i worked in the factory man we were building corrugated pipe uh, advanced drainage system like black corrugated pipe with the green stripe like i worked in the factory building this pipe loading trucks just I mean, hard, hard work. Like, these guys worked their butts off, and I didn't want to do that. So <laughs> um, they said, look, we'll give you an opportunity. You can go to Ohio and be an engineer, or you can go to Georgia and learn how to be a plant manager, and we'll, we'll take you through the system. And, man, you can be a plant manager by the time you're 20, 23 years old. And for a guy from Rockford who doesn't have a lot of money, never had a lot of money, being a plant manager sounded like a pretty cool deal. But I'm like, I just don't know if I want to do that. So I took the engineering role and moved up to Ohio, Cleveland, oh. And I did that for about six months. 
and I wasn't an engineer, I was self-taught, but what, what I benefit, what I gave those guys was I, I had a mechanical mind, but I had the hands where I could build things. So I could take them from concept to paper to prototype and then hand it off to production, which was kind of a neat thing. So that worked for a while and I was there for about six, eight months. And look, I'll be honest, man, they kept on, the engineering department was growing and growing and growing and all these folks that were coming in, they didn't draw like I did. I mean, I drew with a pencil and a piece of paper and they were all drawing on computers. And I was like, this isn't gonna be good for me. And honestly, I didn't really like like it. So I moved back to Illinois. Um, and and do, do you think your race, your your career pursuit of racing and NASCAR is over at this point? Or no. are you just saying this is just a pit stop, I'm going to get back? I, I, I was thinking at that point when I took that job that, man, maybe maybe the racing thing isn't what I want. But I knew I didn't mm. want to work in a factory. I didn't want to go back to Illinois and work in a, you know, Bowman Bolts or Rockford Screw Products. Or, so you're going through know, a process of elimination. Yeah, trying <laughs> More to figure out what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I went back to the Midwest, and I was working with my dad um, and some other race teams up there. Things were going pretty good. And then I got a call from um, uh, Butch Hilton, who I'm sure you guys know him. He's crew chief in the truck series, did some Xfinity stuff, some Cup stuff. He was working with Stanley Smith. And uh, so Butch Hilton was there. Joe Shear Jr. was there. And I knew both of those guys from racing the Midwest. And uh, I got the opportunity to go down there. And what an amazing two years of my life at this point. Yeah. It was Man, you just, I mean, we raced, we raced everything, right? Everything, a cup, uh, what was then Bush Grand National, sportsmen, late models. We did it all, man. There's like six of us, but the crew that we had is what's amazing. Um, I mentioned Butch and, and Joe. We had Philippe Lopez. Yeah. <laughs> we had Ronnie Crooks. We had Todd Foster. Um, man, I know there's another one that I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting right now, but we had like everybody that was on that team ended up coming to Charlotte and being pretty prominent people in the series, which yeah. is really cool. And that was that was how I got down here full time. Wow. So, so you're working with them. Um, what was the team after that? What, what was your move from? So, <laughs> so I went to the 24 car right after Stanley Smith's. Really? Yeah. Was that after Stanley's accident? Or so no, that was actually the before? last. That was the last car that I built for Stanley. Is the one that he crashed at Talladega. Yeah. Um, which was awful. Awful. Yeah. So we were we went to Atlanta in '92, and uh, that was a big deal. That was Gordon's first race, the King's last race, yeah. um, and the 24 was actually parked right next to us. So ah. I'm at the 49 car, Stanley. And man, these guys show up, and they got this hotshot kid driver, and all their equipment's brand new, and you know their their toolbox is brand new, and all these guys are high and tight. And man, I'm a I'm a grease ball racer doing whatever I can to get you know the 49 car to make the race right. And I was like, man, one day I'd love to work on that team, right? What a cool deal to work at Hendrick Motorsports. And we went through the winter and started racing again. The Stanley started to run out of money, so man, one day at lunch, I went home at lunch and I was living in a, a single wide trailer on Stanley Smith's property. <laughs> this is where I live, man. Yeah. It was the where I did the body work on our race cars, uh, hung the body, did the body work was in my garage at the single wide trailer, wow. right? And, and we used for the heat was a propane heater. Mm -hmm. You know, the sure. little turbo oh, heater yeah. guy. I can tell you how many times I would roll out of there sick from body filler dust and the kerosene fumes and all yeah. of that. It was, it's a wonder I didn't die. But nonetheless, um, I went home for lunch one day. I just, I'm gonna call, I'm just gonna call. So I called Hendrick Motorsports and uh, they pick up and this lady, nice lady says Hendrick Motorsports. I said, yeah, may I speak to Ray Everham? And she said, hold, please. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like there ain't no way this is going to happen, right? <laughs> and um, next thing I hear is, this is Ray. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And, and I said, hey, Mr. Everham, my name is Chad Canals. I work with Stanley Smith. Um, I'd love an opportunity to talk to you about coming to work on the 24 team. And, he's, <laughs> and I don't know how many folks really know Ray that well, but he went through a lot of employees and teammates at that time. And he said, well, it just so happens I fired a guy today. When can you be here? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Swear to God, true story. So I was like, uh, I said, tomorrow? And he said, all right, I'll see you at 730. It's noon in Talladega. We were living in Chelsea, Alabama. It's noon there. And I'm thinking, all right, how am I going to get to Charlotte for 730 a.m. now? And I'm working for Stanley. Yeah. Um, we only have my girlfriend's car. She's in college. I got to somehow, we didn't have cell phones, right? I got to somehow get a hold of her, get her back home so I can get the car. And then I got to figure out what I'm going to tell Stanley that I'm not going to be at work. 
And so I went and and I, I feel really bad about this and I love my grandmother to pieces and love her to death. Oh, um, <laughs> and I, I walked back into work and I said I said uh, Stanley I said look man I got I got to go back to Wisconsin my grandmother's not feeling very well. And he's like oh my gosh go. And I, he said are you flying? I'm like no 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 I'm I'm going to drive. And he's like man, that's a long time. You sure? And I'm like yeah yeah I got it. So. I, I got a hold of my girlfriend. She was actually working in a donut shop at the time. Um, had left school, went to the donut shop. I called her, and uh, she came home, and I took the car, and I drove. Got there at uh, about midnight, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. Slept in the parking lot of Hendrick Motorsports. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and <laughs> Wow. So, and, and I remember, um, you know, I'm going to sleep a bit, right? I'm in the front seat of a Ford Probe, right? Probably looking like you just, you know, like a piece of laundry. Man, you know? it was awful, <laughs> just coming right? out of the, Just yeah. awful. And I can remember the sun coming up the next day, and I'm watching all these guys pull into Hendrick Motorsports. I'm like, man. And I'm like watching my watch, and I'm watching my watch, and like 725, I'm like, all right, all right, all right. So I grabbed a shirt that I had thrown in the back and made sure I didn't wrinkle up that shirt, right? I put it on, and I had a, a cup that from a fountain drink in the, the cup holder, and I took the water from it. <laughs> put that through my hair and tried to look reasonable, brushed my teeth a little bit, and I walked in, and uh, I got to meet Ray, and uh, I sat, sat in with him, man, and it was a great conversation. You know, he asked me what I could do, and, and Dale, I told him, I was like, man, I, I can do a lot. I, I don't know that I'm great at anything, but I, I can do a lot, and, you know, kind of went through my background and my history and back and forth, and he said, well, he said, he said, look, I like you. You know, he said, I, I like where you've been. I like your background. I like your, your, I can see your intensity. He says, where, where do you want to be in five years? And, and I just looked at him and I said, in five years, I want your job. Ooh. Ooh. And, and, Ooh. People don't usually like that very much. And straight away, he said, you're hired. <laughs> and that was it. And uh, now, I was pretty far away from his job when I walked in the door. Let me tell you that. Yeah. Uh, when I started, I was a body shop assistant. So I worked in the back, back room in the body shop, sweeping the floors and painting and taping up cars couple things here one they've beefed up the security at hendrick motorsports a lot since then you can't just call and get the crew chief nor can you sit and sleep in the parking lot either can you two no, things sir. that we can be no. sure they do not let no. you do anymore that's true that's true wow that's really uh you know it's such a great story but it's even more unique now because of your promotion yeah, you know, and, and mm. going into the man, a manager role, which everybody probably assumed was going to happen. I doubt you had any assumptions, but well, you know, yeah. everybody just assumes like if your success there and your your ability to sort of put people, the right people, in the right places, that's kind of what mm -hmm. the guy at the top needs to be doing and what he needs to be good at. But um, to be able to basically stand in a in, in a prominent ma manager role at Hendrick. And tell anyone that walks in there, look, this is the commitment that I made. Yeah. This is what I did to, to get the first opportunity here. Do yeah. you have that? Yeah. Right? Do, do you have that? Because um, a lot of guys will ask you to work hard, but when they tell you what their story is, and yeah. golly. <laughs> that guy don't know how to work hard. Right. Who's he at? Yeah. Who's he telling? Uh, he don't he have telling to me? That. Yeah. All right. If you enjoyed that video, you got to listen to the whole show. All the Dell Jr. Download podcasts are available in their entirety for free on all major podcast platforms.